Hey everyone, it's Irene Lyon here. Welcome to this special topic lecture today. It's June. Uh, technically, it is June the 10th. It's the year 2021. And um, if you're new here, thank you for joining on this June day. Um, and we're going to get into the lecture really soon because this is live. I like to wait a second or two to get folks in. If you're listening to the recording and watching the recording after the fact, Thank you for pressing, pressing play afterwards. Um, and maybe as we wait to get a few people on, um, let me know in the chat where you are. Um, are you new to this world? Is this the first time you've attended one of these lectures? Are you one of my students? Um, have you done um, drop-in class or maybe the 21 day nervous system tune-up? Just let me know who you are, where you are and at what level you are at. Um, I have one question that was submitted beforehand on this topic of what it means to be trauma informed. I'm going to define a few terms when we get started. I have some notes here. Um, and also, as you may know, if you are someone who's been around the block with me a few times, I tend to go into different directions. I kind of will take tangents and then come back to the main topic. Um, I will take questions related to this subject. So um, I'll most likely wait a little bit until we get into the, the, the content and what I wanted to share today. Um, but uh, we'll get started soon. It looks like there's 35 people here. Hello, hello. Um, and hey there from California, just starting to learn about self-regulating and orienting via the channel. Thank you for hanging. Um, someone else who's new, um, someone who's done the 21 days. Hey, Dana. Hey there, Amy. Um, did SBSM in 2017. Awesome. Uh, someone from the UK, Texas, UK. Um, super. Okay. So, um, as a quick introduction, I'm Irene Lyon. Um, I obviously run this channel and do videos and post education here and do these live streams. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do so now or after we finish this and be sure to turn on your notifications so that you get these uh, notified notified when we go live, when I post in the community board. Um, and then the other thing for you to know about me is I um, don't just hang out on YouTube. I have an entire company business practice online that is devoted to group online learning teaching you, teaching the world how to become, well, truly trauma-informed is how I like to say it, really trauma-informed, but also teaching you how to learn the language of your nervous system so that you can heal at the body-based level, at the mind-based level, at the environment level, which I'll get into today. Um, one might say I help people heal from traumas of all kind, and we do it a little differently in my world. We don't pick apart with talking all the big, bad, scary things that have occurred to us, as you might with a therapist, we go into the body, we go into the nervous system, we go into the, the spaces, the cells, the organs, the movement of the body, how we make sound, how we interact with the environment, essentially how we can reverse engineer in such a way that the old traumas and the old hurts and the old stressors from the past actually start to bubble up naturally and organically rather than us trying to go find things to work with. Um, so that is a very, very, very short description of what I do. I have, um, again, just a quick, quick note of housekeeping. My website is just my name, irenelion.com. There you will find many resources, eBooks, audio samplers of the exercises I teach that are all free to download. And then of course, if you want to do a little more intensive work with me, I have monthly drop in classes, we have one coming up on Saturday, at the end of this month of June, I'm going to do a summer school intensive, we're going to do three classes over Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you get homework, all that good stuff. Um, I have one program that is self study that you can start at any time, the 21 day nervous system tune up. And then once a year we run smart body, smart mind dubbed SBSM. We just finished the 2021 round. We'll do that again, March of 2022. So I wanted to just get that out 
for those of you who are new here, if you want to do the practical work, and I hope you do, we offer, offer that as well. That is what, um, that's what we do within my company and within the team that I have. And we're all very trauma informed and trained in a methodology called somatic experiencing, somatic practice. And many of us are also trained in the movement arts such as Feldenkrais, Qigong, Tai Chi. Okay, gonna go back to the chat here, just check in and see who's here. Um, thanks everybody for uh, chiming in here. Someone said they saw my article on the meditation bubble bursting. Yes, it's a good article. We can post that here in the chat and in the, the resource section. So if you're listening to this recording, underneath this video <clears throat> is a show more section. Everything I mention, whether it's an article or something on my site, it'll all be posted under there as well. Hello, hello from Israel, Jerusalem. Um, awesome. Okay, great. So let's get going. So this concept of what it means to be trauma-informed. So if you saw the advertisement for this, it was sort of what it means to be trauma-informed. And then I had a few types of individuals, uh, parents, coaches, healers, first responders. Um, those are the main ones, right? Um, if you're a boss, that kind of thing. And I was looking before we did this today, I started and just wanted to see what do other people mean when they say trauma informed? Because in the past, I've had a few folks who have gone to trauma informed workshops. And let me just tell you from what I heard, they were far from being in my opinion, trauma informed at the neurobiological level. <clears throat> so one of the things that I saw, and these are all accurate, but again, this is from the internet, not um, so much my work, but what I've seen other people say is being trauma informed is recognizing that someone may have stored trauma or they're living with some kind of trauma um, to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma or post-traumatic stress. The other is um, a trauma-informed situation would make it such that we don't uh, perpetuate or re-traumatize the individual. So that's another uh, topic or another comment there. And then the other one is safety, being able to, pro to provide safety, being able to really listen and hold space. Um, this is a real common term we hear in the coaching world, holding space. And in my opinion, it needs to be a little more refined. So I'm gonna get into some of the refinements. Now, as a general kind of rule, I know and I believe from what I've seen, I haven't met anyone yet in this Western human world of ours, and I've traveled a lot and I've met lots of people. I have yet to met anyone, meet anyone who hasn't in some way experience something bad, scary, overwhelming, traumatizing. And in my world of somatic experiencing and somatic practice, the more somatic based healing arts, we see trauma as something in the body, in the nervous system. And it's essentially anything that happens to us that is overwhelming, that we cannot fully feel, digest, process, be with, see, integrate, and heal. And I'm gonna speak a little bit today about children and infants and what that what it means to be trauma-informed from a par parental point of view. Um, but one of the things that defines trauma in my la language in my world is this dysregulation of something called the autonomic nervous system, the fight, flight, freeze responses, but then how that impacts our entire physiology. So one of the um, kind of classic signs and symptoms that let's just say someone has trauma, we have thought of that as just post-traumatic stress. So someone is very hypervigilant, someone startles easily. The classic example um, that we'll often hear is if somebody hears a big, large bang, um, and it's, you may hear a big, large bang in my background. There's a big truck driving down my alleyway right now. So if you hear that, um, not to worry, it's just something on the outside. 
I'm going down my street. But if someone hears a large bang and they have got residual dysregulation, they are stuck in fight, flight, freeze, they may hear that large bang and startle and not realize that it's not a real threat. So they might think that it's a real threat. They get taken back into that world when they were harmed. And we often have seen this in relationship to war. Um, the concept of PTSD really came out after, if I believe the Vietnam War and that classic example of veterans come back to their home, they hear a car backfire and they think they're back in the, the fields with bombs and shooting and IEDs going off and things coming out of the sky. Now that's accurate. Physical attack, sexual attack, abuse, um, big, scary injuries, car accidents. These are all truly things, events that occur to humans that throw us off our regulation. However, the other thing to understand about trauma is that it can also be very insidious and very micro. And by that, I mean little things that occur, that occur to us that we are within that aren't life threatening, right? They're not going to risk us bleeding out or being paralyzed or being put into a shock of a bomb or something like that or, or a natural disaster but they might be the parents who are angry at each other all the time. And the little person, the child is constantly in a state of survival, fight, flight, and then they have to shut down. Um, being in a school system where we're being bullied, um, being in a family system where we're not allowed to be authentic and who we truly are. This is something I'm gonna get into as I talk a bit more about trauma informed in the context that I like to speak about. Um, so we sometimes underestimate the things that occur to us that put us into a state of terror, panic, fear, stress. The good news, of course, is that because of neuroplasticity and our ability to change and rewire, we can shift these things and we wanna shift them from the somatic body-based autonomic nervous system level, those fight, flight, freeze responses. So um, the one thing, I want to propose is we might call this being trauma informed. And I like to say, what would it be like, or what would it be? How would it be different if we were to just say, what would it be like to be human informed? Now, I know that seems kind of not the same as trauma informed, but being human informed means we understand the human biology, the human neurology, what a human needs to feel safe, what occurs to a human being when they are under attack, under intense stress, under ridicule by the peers and people around them, under surgical intervention, intervention when they're going in for maybe a procedure, post-accident, what is going on at that human physiology level so that we as say a bystander or a first responder, or a parent, or a coach, or a healer, or whatever, when we understand what occurs at the human level and the physiology, it's actually quite simple to know how to be trauma-informed. Hope that makes sense. So um, just put that on the shelf and think about it for a second. And I often say to th folks that I um, have consulted in the past, who are coaches, healers, wellness providers, can you, can you basically just be human with someone? And often if we change that and we stop trying to fix or heal or demand something from an individual, stuff starts to shift and come out. So I wanna start by going through sort of a few words. There are one, two, three, four, five words I'm gonna name, and then I'm gonna use those in context with these individuals, people, groups of people, and how they may bring a more trauma or a more human in informed approach to their interactions. And then, like I said, I have a question that was submitted before the call. And if there are questions related to this, um, I will get to those as well. So the five words, one is education, 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 education. So important. And I'll tell you why in a second. The second is attunement. So being able to attune 
to others and most importantly, attuned to ourselves. The third, orienting, learning how to be in the here and now, in this moment, now, not the past, not the future, but right now. The next word is safety. Safety was actually something that popped up a lot when I was looking up trauma-informed on the web, but we have to define what safety is. And for us, for me, in my world, safety is cellular safety at the neurobiological, neurophysiological level where our stress organs and our entire body is at good ease and regulation when there isn't a threat. And what many of us live with, and this might be true of you and let me know if it is, is you know that you're living in an environment that's fairly okay. There, you know, there's no bombs falling from the sky, I hope. Um, I know that's not gonna be the case all around our world, but let's just say you're in a home where it is safe. There are many people who will be in this kind of safe situation. I say this with air quotes, but their physiology is saying otherwise. Their adrenals are saying otherwise. Their brainstem is saying otherwise. The gut is saying otherwise. The immune system is saying otherwise. The cardiovascular system is saying otherwise. And one of the parts of this work is learning how to teach and rewire these stress organs and the entire somatic physiology to no longer feel unsafe. And it's a lot more than just saying, let's provide you with a safe space because you can have the safest space in the world, but if that internal physiology is saying, no, 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 I'm still stuck in my mother's house where all this bad stuff was happening, if we don't address that, the system won't feel safe. So that was the, the fourth word. And then the fifth word is authenticity. And I already mentioned that once, but we'll get into that when we get into this a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna start with a story, because stories are always great. Um, yesterday, actually, I love how these little things just pop into my world to, to inform these things. I was walking um, outside uh, near a park here um, by the ocean where I live, and um, there was clearly some school children and their teachers that were setting up those obstacle courses. I think it was like a sports day, a field day. This happens here in Canada at the end of the school year. Kids go out and they play games. And it's funny how we wait till the end of the year to do that, but that's when it happens. And so they had all these obstacle courses and it was clear that there were some um, children there who were much younger. So it was the mothers of probably the grade school kids and they, some of them had their toddlers with them around the age of three-ish, old enough to walk. And this one little one, I'm not sure if it was a boy or girl, it doesn't matter, had a, a soccer ball in their hand. So they were old enough to hold the ball. They were old enough to walk easily on the grass without falling or wobbling. And I could see that child wanted to take that ball. I could feel it. I could attune with them by the look on their eye and where they were looking that they wanted to throw the ball into the net, this little baby net that the kids were working with. And so this comes back to those five words. The final one was authentic authenticity. And I was orienting to them. I was attuning to them. And the mom came up and she said, honey, honey, no, you don't throw that. You have to try kicking it. Those are meant to be kicked. Now, Technically speaking, yes, a soccer ball is meant to be kicked. But if you ever watched a soccer or a football match, sometimes they throw the ball back into the uh, into the field or they'll kick it with their or they bounce it off of their head. The kid is three. She's feeling the desire to, to throw the ball. Why not let her throw the ball, right? And so that is one example of, again, was that the mom's fault? Not so much. She's just going with the conditioning of what you're supposed to do with the ball. She's probably trying to teach her little one. You kick the soccer ball, you don't throw it. In my opinion, at that age, it doesn't matter. Her impulse, her healthy aggression was to throw that ball with her little hands um, and see what happens. And then as that impulse was being built, as her authentic authenticity was being expressed, 
um, mom misattuned. And so one might say, oh, come on, Irene, that's not a trauma. And I say, you're right, it isn't some horrible thing, but that is the kind of connection and attunement and listening we want to develop with other humans. And so why not let her throw the ball and then maybe you come up and you kick it to them and then they see what you do and they're like, oh, kick, I can kick. And then you have this interaction. So when it comes to, let's just say, children, parents, one of the things about being trauma-informed slash human-informed is learning how to listen to these cues, being attuned to them, and it starts super young. It starts the moment little one comes into the world, we want to connect. So part of understanding this human-informed, trauma-informed concept when a little child, so if you can remember my five words, one of them was education. I have found that us humans at this point in time, we really need to understand the education of the nervous system. And so as a quick aside, and I have many other videos that talk about this, um, one is called How to Create Healthy Humans, starts here, we'll post it. Um, when we come out as little ones, as little humans, we don't have the capacity to self-regulate. And we know this, a child comes out and they can't just start walking right away. Like certain animals in the wild, they are 100% dependent on an older, more mature human to care for them, to feed them, to clothe them, to keep them safe, all these things, to keep them warm, et cetera, et cetera. That primary attunement at the beginning gives that child the ability to learn how to feel themselves with safety. So then there comes that other word, safety. And so when we are raising children, we have to really, really listen to their biological needs. And often where that gets thrown off is when the caregiver can't listen to their own biological needs. So it's this very weird cycle we've gotten into as humans where we've cut off due to society, conditioning, the rat race, all the stuff, we've cut off these natural impulses in our system. And so we then have this little person that comes out and a lot of times parents have no clue what to do. They're terrified. And from what I've seen, from what I've felt in talking with um, moms and dads who have parented and had ease and parenthood have had difficulty. It's that listening to their own physiology, being informed, human informed with their body allows them to be more connected with that little one and all the different sounds, all the different whimpers, all the different little pieces and signals that gives them a quality that puts out to the caregiver that says, I need this. And so from that very base level, when we have our needs met, without any conditions, right? We're hungry, we get fed, we have this, this happens, et cetera. That sets up the nervous system to be healthy and learn self-regulation. Now, the reason why that's important is because when that little human grows up, the more attuned they are and more attached they are to their caregiver, the better they will be human informed when they get older. They will build self-regulation through that connection with the parent, which then gives them what we call healthy nervous system function. When you have that on board, you are better able to empathize with everything else in the world. I'm making a huge, huge leap from childhood infancy to adulthood. I hope this is making sense. So when we get that from the beginning, this is like that utopic concept of if all babies could be cared for with attunement, safety, connection, if all the caregivers have that in themselves, it just naturally transfers. And then when that naturally transfers, that little human grows up to be healthy and robust. Doesn't mean they won't have stressors, traumas occur to them, but when we have that foundation, we bounce back a lot faster. So, with that said, that's kind of a very 
foundational start to this concept of being trauma informed, because when we have that, we know what to do when someone is hurting, when that little one grows up to be a parent themselves, they then have the wiring to know what to do when their little people are in their world, when they're looking after their offspring and so on and so on. But so many of us, um, so many of us didn't get that. I would say if you're here and you know you're suffering from various signs and symptoms of trauma and dysregulation, chances are you didn't get that. And that is something to grieve, that is something to connect to. And then the next question is now, what can you do in your current world to change that pattern in your family system? Okay, so that's in terms of the, the, the child, I don't even like to say parent, it can be the caregiver, whoever is looking after that little one. So no matter what, how well we can tune attune to us ourselves will allow us to be better attuned to the little people that need our help so they can learn how to build a robust nervous system. Um, one of the things that we know through some research, specifically the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, and this falls into kind of more classic trauma-informed lingo, um, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, and I've done a SoundCloud audio on this, we'll post that near here, so, near here so you can listen to that. What that study found, and it's been kind of going on, ongoing since the late 80s, um, is that when children are brought up in very adverse, high stress environments, so abuse, of course, not enough um, shelter, food, parents are mentally unwell, parents are incarcerated, um, there's addiction in the family, maybe there's verbal abuse, emotional abuse, that kind of toxic shame. When that isn't healed, it predicts our health later in life. And by health, I mean our susceptibility to mental illness, so anxiety, depression, also chronic illness, so autoimmune problems, cardiovascular problems, cancer, um, chronic fatigue, chronic pain. It also influences our, um, our likelihood to become addicted to certain things and to also get into risky, unsafe situations. So this is why I started off with the parent-child thing because that influences so much later in life. And so for those of you here who maybe are helpers, healers, you work with folks, or you're just a concerned in wanting to be informed citizen, the signs and symptoms of trauma aren't just panic attacks or PTSD or anxiety. Yes, those are true. Those are signs of the system being in what we call dysregulation. So um, fight, flight, always running the front of the bus. But then we have the chronic illnesses. So let's just say, I'm gonna kind of riff a little bit, you are a health coach, for example, or you're someone in the healing and helping profession. And let's just say you're working with dietary changes and healthy lifestyle changes. Those are all wonderful and super duper important. They help people a lot. I was in that industry in my 20s um, and early 30s, so I know it's important. But one of the things we commonly see and I hear um, from clients and the coaches is someone will say, I keep working with this client or this group of clients and they're doing all the right things. They're cleaning up their diet. They're moving, they're exercising. All, all these things are changing, but they still have this gut problem or they still have this anxiety thing going on, or they still have insomnia, or they still have chronic pain, or they still have an autoimmune thing. When this diet, this lifestyle change has helped 80% of my clients, right? So let's just say this is a hypothetical situation. That, for those of you who are coaches, healers, et cetera, is a very good indication that there is an underlying dysregulation in the nervous system that is not allowing the system to repair and recover. So I'm gonna go a little education on you for a second. This might be review for some, but it's good to always review it. I work specifically with the autonomic nervous system via the lessons and exercises that I teach my students. And one of the things that we work with directly 
but in an indirect way, it's strange, is this fight, flight, freeze. We get people to start to notice when they are in fight mode, when they're in flea mode, which is a sympathetic high adrenaline state. We get them to notice when they're in shutdown mode, the freeze mode, when they start to disconnect from their body, when they start to numb out their feelings, when they start to lose hearing and their eyes start to not engage with the environment properly. The fight, flight, freeze, that is governed, that is that autonomic nervous system. But the autonomic nervous system also governs, governs our digestion, our heart, our hormones, our reproductive systems, the blood flow through our system, how things are excreted, how we take in oxygen, all of it, how we regenerate, how we repair cells, how our immune system gets enhanced. So imagine this, if you will, if the system is constantly unsafe at this neurobiological level and it's looking for danger over and over again, the last thing it's going to want to do is repair and regenerate, right? It's in alert mode or it's in hibernation mode. It is spending so much energy in that realm that the energy for the basic housekeeping of the cells just ain't happening. And then this is how and why the system starts to break down with these autoimmune illnesses, cardiovascular troubles, chronic fatigue, chronic pain, gut problems, immune um, system deficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to just mention that for those who are new so that you know that this is the connection between being stuck in those hypervigilant or hypo kind of freeze states and the system getting sick. So the reason I was mentioning that was, again, one of the ways of being trauma informed at that coach healer level, but also for just you who are interested, is to not underestimate how an ailment might actually be connected to a system that is trapped in intense survival stress. And that survival stress can be something from 50 years ago. It could be something that happened in utero when you were being carried by your mother. It can even be something that happened transgenerationally before you were even born to your ancestors. So these things get passed and shared via this autonomic nervous system situation. If we go back a little bit to the part I was talking about with the kids and the babies, if you have a mom or a dad, usually it's the mother though, the primary caregiver, whom is frightened because she had a tough time growing up or her parents had a tough time growing up and she has never stopped to consider her level of panic and fear of the world. It's just in her system. That is how she knows the world. That panic and fear will directly get transferred to that infant, whether she wants to or not. And this is where, again, going back to my five words, education, learning how to restore safety, learning how to orient and be in the here and now is super duper important. Okay. I'm going to read a question that came in, and then I'm going to get back to my list here. And thank you for all your... Um, questions and comments, everything here will be um, saved on the replay. So not to worry. Let me have a little water. Okay. So this came in um, from Jessica to email and she writes, what would Irene recommend to inform medical health professionals who aren't trained or don't have knowledge in the nervous system awareness as a safeguard to help prevent treatment that is brain behavior based that could lead to more trauma. So you're wanting to know what can we do to help medical professionals become more aware so they don't cause more trauma with the treatment their treatments they're doing. And then you have an example, which I'll read. Um, for example, with a psychiatric or chronic illness um, where uninformed treatment can lead to further dysregulation or trauma. So how can, how can this be taught? Now, this is a great question. And honestly, 
this is where it gets a bit tricky because the doctor, the psychiatrist, the massage therapist, if they aren't aware and alert to this concept, to how survival stress gets stored in the body, chances are that one, they're not aware of their own dysregulations. And if they're not aware of that, being told or being asked to have um, radar for this is going to be that much harder. I remember, I think it was Gabor Maté, who some of you know, he's actually here in my hometown of Vancouver. He's a physician, uh, very much specialized in chronic illness, hospice care, addiction. Um, and he's sort of the the superstar right now of getting these these concepts out um and he would um lecture do lectures around the ace study that i just mentioned and the connection between early adversity and stress later in life trauma later in life and he said you present the research because it is to the point where i would say it's factual it's been so studied the statistical significance is through the roof um, and so these doctors, they know stats and they're seeing the data that says this stuff, all these conditions, all these medical conditions, you know, that are chronic, not things like a genetic defect, but chronic medical conditions are connected, if not 100 percent, I'm being a little extravagant there, but let's say 90 percent related to this early life. He says, when I teach this stuff, there's rarely any debate. There are very few questions because they know what I'm saying is 100% true. He said, on average, there will be people who get up and just leave in the middle of these lectures. And the third is people will start dry coughing. They'll start <laughs> coughing almost like they're choking. That is a sign, and knowing what I know, that their systems are going into a bit of sympathetic, a bit of autonomic dysregulation because they're hearing this information and they know that they probably are also in this boat of early adversity. And so the sympathetic autonomic nervous system goes into a reaction. It's being triggered by that information. So if a physician, if a psychiatrist, if a mental health professional is triggered there's nothing wrong with being triggered, but the question is, Jessica and everybody here, what do they do with that? Do they get interested? Do they wanna know? Do they wanna learn? Or do they just shut it down? And they're like, I can't look at that. And here's the trouble. If the, if the healthcare provider is not open to working on their own stuff, from my experience, everybody here, um, they're not gonna be able to help people at this level that I'm talking about. And so you might be asking, well, are we all screwed, Irene? The, the answer is no, but this is where you as the individual, so you as the consumer of a healthcare provider, you as the client, you as the patient, you have got to advocate for yourself and go back to my words here. You've got to get educated. You have to learn how to attune to yourself. You have to learn how to orient to the here and now. You have to learn how to build safety back up into your system at that cellular level. And you have to be authentic so that you can express what's happening. I'll answer or not I'll answer. I'm going to share another story. Let me have a little water here. Um, I was recently uh, had to have surgery, knee surgery. It's all good. I'm walking again. Everything's fine. And when I went in just about six weeks ago, maybe two weeks, meh, about eight weeks ago now, I had never gone into a medical procedure that significant with the knowledge I know now. Okay. The last time I had a surgery, it was 20 years ago in 2000. So if, even more. And I didn't have any of this on board. I had just only done my training in fitness and in nutrition and an exercise rehab. I hadn't gotten into the mind body trauma worlds. It was like 24, 25. And going into this surgery a couple of months ago was absolutely fascinating because I allowed myself to experience the little blips in panic, 
the little bits of not wanting them to put the, uh, the IV in my arm, but I know I have to. And so with the nurse, I then attuned to her and I was authentic. And I said, Hey, I'm feeling, I can feel my heart is a little high as I see you unpackage that, that, um, that needle. And she, most nurses are actually quite good. You know, if you say that they'll empathize. And so she was then able to say, Oh, okay, that's fine. We'll go real slow. I'll make sure that my hands aren't too cold. And we had a discussion as opposed to me sitting there terrified, hearing my heartbeat and then being tense when she puts it in. And if you've ever had a, an IV put in, it doesn't, it feels bad when your muscles and your fascia are tense and you're freaked out. And so by having that little bit of interaction, being authentic, stating that I was feeling a little unsafe, even though I knew that I was in great hands, it brought my system down. We connected. And then because of that interaction, I felt better asking her more questions after that. Um, and so I share that because Sometimes we need to be the ones, we need to be the ones who are trauma informed, human informed, so that we can bridge that attunement with these healthcare professionals. Um, so Jessica, to answer again, another part of this is I think a lot of what has to happen is we, the people, we, the patient, we, the client, we need to understand these pieces so that when we do go in to the doctor's office, get a treatment, we can say, can you just hold on? Can you wait? Or can you show me again what you're going to do? Or can you explain to me again what's in this stuff that you're about to give me? Um, I don't feel comfortable. Can I wait? You know what? I just I need to stand up for a moment and breathe a little bit. If the doctor, nurse, healthcare provider is really nasty and says you can't do that, then of course that's going to make you feel even more unsafe. And that's where I would say, well, then maybe that's when you leave and you don't get you don't get treated by that person, but most people are pretty good. So, um, and then the other thing I will mention here, Jessica, is this is where when we can be in understanding of our nervous systems and really learn about them, we're less likely to get into trouble with various treatments. Now, let's just say, for example, some of you are here and you know you've had an, uh, an adverse reaction. You are terrified of a medical procedure or going to see a doctor or whatever because of past history. So this is where doing some work with yourself to feel those fears, feel those mm, injustices, if you will, with that medical professional and work through the emotions, the sensations, the somatic representation that still lives in the body. And so this might be, maybe you work with a one-on-one -on -one practitioner, maybe you work through some of my online materials to help track these pieces that are stuck in the system. Because by doing that, it makes it so that more space is within the system. And then when you do go to have that treatment, that therapy, your system is less on guard, less on guard. And then to wrap it back to my example, by going into this surgery of mine a couple of months ago with this more trauma-informed lens, understanding the education, attunement, being authentic, I was actually able to heal some pretty bad experiences in the past with surgeries that I had had as young as age five when I had my first surgery, which is a tonsillectomy. And so I actually came out of this experience feeling very healed in a strange way. It was very, very liberating to advocate for myself. So for all of you here who are healers, helpers, teachers, mind body workers, social workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, how, whoever you are, really do not underestimate the power of doing your own work and understanding this from your biology goes back to that example I gave with the little child, the infant and the parent. When you have it on board in your system, you will better, you will do your job better. You will be able to attune to people better and you will know exactly what they need and they will feel greater safety in you because you're more attuned and more authentic and safer in your system and understand all these places. 
Um, someone asked, how can we find a practitioner? Do you have people that you recommend? So I don't have um, a solid referral list anymore. My students and my programs, um, we do share the, um, the team members that govern and, and answer questions within my membership sites, within my programs and courses. I did a, a video a little while ago, um, this angelic is your name on how to find a good somatic practitioner. Watch that. Just Google how to find a good somatic practitioner. Irene Lyon will pop it in the chat here. Um, and I have a, a, a few pointers on what to look for, what to ask for. And the first one is to ensure that the practitioner is doing their own healing work, that they are working on themselves, that they are not like those doctors in that auditorium that Gabor Mate was talking to. And I'm generalizing here, but you're, that they're keen, they're excited about this work. It's not always easy, but we want the practitioner that we're working with to be living and breathing this work. Okay, great question. Great question, Jessica. Thank you so much. Now I'm gonna talk about first responders in a second um, because I've worked with a few, I have friends who are, and what occurs in those situations, so this would be firefighters, police officers, ambulance drivers, uh, lifeguards, um, you know, people who are on scene with sometimes some really intense accidents and traumas, right? And in speaking with a friend of mine who would come to scenes that were pretty gory and pretty intense, it was clear to them that one of the reasons why so many of these first responders have addiction troubles and stress and PTSD is they're not processing what they're seeing in the moment because they can't, because they have to do their job. They have to save the life. They have to deal with the circumstance. And so they put their somatic physiology on hold to help others, which is absolutely commendable in my opinion. Um, and so they're having to stuff all this stuff down. And yes, sometimes they will have a psychiatrist or a psychologist to talk to, but what has to be worked with to be trauma informed, human, human informed in that situation for the first responder is to understand, again, back to these words, education, safety, orienting. They have to understand that if they feel and sense terror or horror or they can't look at something because it's so gruesome but they have to that that response gets stored in their body and then they have to again granted they want to do this level of work do the work afterwards either with a, a good somatic practitioner or they learn the tricks and tools that i teach and the regulation techniques i use and, and teach my students so that they can tune in to those really scary visuals that maybe they saw, um, tune into the somatic sensations that they had to shut down, um, tune into the desire to want to run and scream when they see something. One of my, again, uh, an acquaintance, they said when they got this education on board and they understood the nervous system at this physiological level, when they did come on scene and someone let's say unfortunately had perished in a bad accident and there was nobody there at the moment you know the 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 other people hadn't come on scene they would let themselves scream like full scream get the sound out the gasp the, the cry the oh my god i can't believe i'm seeing this they would allow themselves to get that out and it made all the difference because they're not trapping that intensity and then they can actually go on with their work and probably be a lot safer because they're not dissociating from their body. But that is not always possible, especially when, let's say the client, the patient, the person that you're rescuing is still alive. You don't want to scare them by screaming in their face because you're seeing a femur that's like cracked off to one side where it shouldn't be. Right. And so if, that, if we then turn the tables to the patient or the person that they're working with, being trauma informed with them is being able to attune to them and see what's going on. You know, do they do they need comforting? Are they orienting? 
Are they um, agitated? And then you have to go in and attune to that and connect with them, co-regulate with them so that their system can settle. We want systems to settle when there's been big accidents. When we can settle, it lessens the likelihood of them ending up with post-traumatic stress afterwards. Now, of course, there's also um, the situation where if things are so unsafe in a first responder situation and there's no time to connect with them and you have to rescue them, you have to save them, you might need to be rough with them, do it with care, do it with intention, do it with empathy. And then when that person is stable and back to being alert, can you, the first responder or you, the ER doctor or whoever it is, have the knowledge to say, hey, that was a pretty intense Thing that happened just want to let you know that you know you did so well we're here for you and um, just let us know if there's anything you want to talk about if you're feeling anything intense even the words that you say rather than just do you want to talk about it it's like that must have been really scary right kind of like you would with a kid who maybe just got into an accident let's say a kid falls off their bike I've actually done a video on this it's actually one of the better um, descriptions of how to connect with a child when they've had an accident. I won't go into the full scenario. We'll post it in there. Um, it's called uh, Functional Freeze Explained. But when someone falls, especially a child, you want to connect with them, but you also don't want to smother them. There needs to be, again, this is that trauma-informed lens. That little one, that person just had a massive accident. Their system's in a shock state. They might not even be able to hear you because their system is navigating all of the pain. And that's where you have to, again, attune back to my words, orient to what's going on, provide safety that isn't smothering and let their system actively re-engage with the environment, with the orienting response. And then once they are able to connect, then you start talking to them. Right. This comes back to I know I'm kind of dipping in all sorts of places here. This is how I fly sometimes. If we go back again to the parent kid situation. Again, if a child just had something really intense happen, you as the caregiver need to check your own dysregulation and your own activation because your worry, your panic, your intensity may get felt by them and then they'll shut down their response. And so we need to kind of put our big people pants on and be like, okay, they're processing this. I'm just going to wait until they're ready to engage with me. And this is the same with any relationship. If you have a partner, a friend, um, two adults, it doesn't work well when people are just constantly attacking back and forth. There needs to be moments for people to pause, reorient. And if you can do that, if you can be informed, trauma informed in your in your body and your system, they will feel that hopefully, and that will have help them deescalate their activation, their fight flight, or it might help take them out of their shutdown response. Okay. Someone just uh, wrote here, let me just move this. So I'm looking at it head on. Shouldn't our body be equipped for all of this and know how to recover and heal and such? I guess not because we didn't come with a pamphlet, how to be human and handle traumatic experiences. So thank you, invite the light for that question. A hundred percent, we should know how to do this. And um, what's interesting is that because of our society, our conditioning, and this goes back 10,000 years back to when we domesticated plants and animals, we've taken ourselves out of our natural rhythms. As soon as we started to plant crops and do agriculture and domesticate things, we no longer were going with the flow of the sun and the weather and, and our internal sensations of what we needed. We started to manage things and so the cool thing, invite the light, is that when we get this education on board, when we start to experience ourselves from this nervous system point of view, when we start to heal these old survival stressors, we do start to know exactly what to do. 
we start to see things in a nervous system lens. And when that occurs, um, it's almost like you do get the pamphlet for how to be human and how to handle traumatic experiences. Um, so you are correct. We should, I say that with air quotes, know how to do this, but we've been so bleached out of our internal biology's organic intelligence that we've completely lost connection to it. And so what I am interested in and what I do with my students is we recover that, we remember it, we bring it back into the system so that we do know what to do. And the beauty too of this is that by getting these pieces back on board, we are becoming skilled in all parts of life. It isn't just with our own sensations. It allows us to be connected with people better. It allows us to be connected with our work better. It allows our autonomic nervous system to govern our digestion and immune system better. It allows us to actually see the world in a better way. Many of the students will say, I've never seen the trees and the nature that's outside as vivid and as vibrant as I have right now, because I'm actually seeing it from a different lens. Um, so yes, I, I want everyone to know this and not everybody does. And we'll get it back when we, we start learning at this day, this base foundational level. Okay. Let me just see if there's anything else I wanted to talk about that's specific to this idea of being trauma informed. Um, when it comes to um, this idea of trauma informed and what that means, I the one thing I want everyone here to understand, it's not necessarily about the signs, the symptoms. It is, but it's about that organic connection to ourselves, which then by default helps us organically connect with those that we are needing to be trauma informed with, or as I said, human informed at the beginning. So I, I'll use an example again. Let's say you're a fitness trainer, something that I used to do. And let's say your client is terrified to push themselves to be more intense in their aerobic activity, let's just say. One of the things that you will understand when you become more knowledge within the nervous system elements, the education attunement, is that one reason someone might be afraid to push their intensity up is because when their heart rate goes up, it actually mimics fear response. It mimics adrenalized response to maybe that scary stuff that happened to them when they were young, right? And so, if that person has never stopped to consider that a high heart rate is coupled with that scary household I was brought up in all the time, they might never ever consider that actually this is an old memory that is currently in my body, but let's see what happens if we do increase the heart rate and just feel it and realize there's no one around us who's trying to threaten us but the system is remembering that increase in heart rate as if it was back then 30 years ago. So by being that fitness trainer, by being the massage therapist who is starting to touch a part of a person's body and all of a sudden they notice that their system, sh you know, shudders or freezes, or all of a sudden the person starts breathing differently. When we understand how the physiology responds to old traumas, fight, flight, freeze, and then we're working with the person in current time, we can better navigate and communicate and say, hey, I just noticed that um, when I move my hands here, your breath changed. Did you notice that? And the person might not even notice it. But by inserting that little bit of, hey, did you notice this? It then has the person who's maybe getting the massage, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tune into that a bit more, right? It doesn't mean you're necessarily doing trauma work with that person, but you're making them aware of how their physiology is changing in relationship to that touch. Same with, again, the fitness trainer, you know, who's like pushing this whole no pain, no gain, come on, go, go, go. 
sometimes people will do that to appease and to just be like, okay, I got to do this, but they're overriding their fear response. And so by actually being able to tune into, oh, I, my heart going up, it feels a little scary. If that trainer is like, oh, you're fine, you're fine, keep going, keep pushing, um, they might miss an opportunity for that client to tune into something that actually is really, really important. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that um, we don't want to be able to increase our heart rate. We do. It's super duper important to challenge that cardiovascular system. But when we're overriding it and not listening to these little cues, um, it's not that we're doing a disservice to these folks, but we're not allowing them to feel the potential healing that might be bubbling up from that. So I hope that little bit of an example gave some, some context to how we might be better trauma slash human informed when we're working with people in the coaching, healing, helping profession. Again, for the first responders, if there are any of you here, to allow yourself, just as a reminder, to process the big scary things that you've seen because when we're holding that stuff inside, it lessens our capacity to feel in other parts of life. And I think that's maybe why there is a tendency for a lot of abuse and addiction in those professions is people are just trying to calm down or they're trying to feel themselves with something that's stimulating, right? And so how can we actually take the system and help it get rid of those stressors so that they can do the job better and obviously live better and easier? Okay, I'm going to go into the, the um, questions here and see if there are some related to this. Um, uh, invite the light. Again, you said it's like us humans really lost our ways and connection to ourselves and earth. And we're now working on getting back to that 100%. Yes, that's exactly what we're doing right now. You see, I was in the fitness and nutrition industry for nearly 15 years. I left it because it was very clear to me that to work at that level needed a bigger lens of understanding the human physiology. And as a collective, we've been trying so damn hard to improve ourselves with exercise, with diet, with mindfulness, with mind body, with all these you know, weekend retreats of healing and group work and all of this, and all of that stuff is 100% great. However, if we are not tuned into the unconscious underlying survival mechanisms that essentially drive our behavior, biology drives behavior, if we're not looking at those, we're not creating the foundation through which these other practices will just skyrocket our health and our consciousness and our mind and our creativity and our relationships. So get this on board and then all those other things just sing a lot, lot easier and a lot more beautifully. Okay. Penelope says, although indigenous communities know all of this, not scientifically, but intuitively, yes, they do. And of course, with all the traumas in those communities, they've been disconnected from their bodies, right? They're, many of them are living in fight, flight, freeze, which is why we see such high rates of addic addiction and abuse in such communities. And trauma is this, it's just repeating. And so again, so much of what occurs where we harm others or we harm ourselves is this cycle, the cycle of dysregulation hasn't stopped. Um, how can I be your student, Irene? Start with my programs. Join me for drop-in class this Saturday. We're doing our June drop-in class on Saturday. All the information is on my site. Um, and then start with my programs. I don't do private sessions at this point, um, but get into the work, start learning with my courses. Um, let's see here. Just reading the comments, you guys, for those just listening. Someone said, my therapist does that all the time. She points out my physiological behavior. Great, great. And then I say, can you start to notice your physiological behavior when you're not with the therapist, when you're not with the practitioner? That was one of the reasons why um, I 
I don't want to say quit forever because I might go back to private practice when I'm older. Um, but it wasn't enough for me to just, it wasn't satisfying enough to just have someone with me for an hour. I wanted to keep teaching them like do homework at home, do these practices. How can you keep the practice going when you're not with me? I don't want you to become dependent on me so that your system can feel safe. I want you to teach yourself with these tools, how to learn again, back to my list, the education, how to be attuned, how to orient to the here and now, how to build more safety at that cellular level, how to be authentic, right? This is a, these are big things that take time. And so that is one of the reasons why I brought all the work online. So you can learn it um, like you would uh, going to university or going to a school semester. Thanks everybody for your comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Sambal, you ask, I'm wondering if there's a difference between the male and female nervous systems and would that change how we work with our system? You know, I've seen a few people um, distinguish those. I am pretty simple and just to the point and males and females both have a nervous system and we have different hormones. Some of us have different hormones, right? Like we all have adrenaline, we all have insulin, we all have thyroid and all of that. But then of course, our reproductive organs produce different kinds of chemicals, different kinds of hormones. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone is so unique in how they experience themselves. Um, people will say women are usually more empathetic and more caregiving. That's not always the case. Many of my clients have been deeply abused and hurt by their by their mothers, and and some were saved by the kindness of their fathers and grandfathers. And in some situations, it's flipped, and it's the other way around, right? And so, um, I tend to just say, focus on the person, focus on their history, focus on their physiology, and of course, yes, know that there are different hormonal structures, different organ structures. Um, different uh, ways in which those systems work based on that chemistry. But at the end of the day, each person is so individual and you just got to work with that, in my opinion. Um, okay. Uh, Carla asks, Irene, what do you have to say about biology having an impact on healing from trauma? Well, biology, if you mean the biology internally, it has everything to do with it. So, um, you know, the term biology is typically supposedly supposed to be for non-humans, right? It's the stuff that's um, in the, 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 the flora in the environment. Whereas when we talk about the human biology, we're technically supposed to say physiology, um, but it's so important. And this is why I am such a stickler for, I would say non dumbed down education. I did a video on this just a week ago or two weeks ago, why we need to understand the biology. Um, when our biology, if I take this one step further, if I try to tune into psychically what you were meaning, when our physiology, when our fight, flight, and freeze responses, which is our biology, our physiology, when they are stuck and hyper alert, it is very difficult for, for our stored traumatic stressors to fully resolve and integrate. We need to understand how to take ourselves out of those high intense hypervigilant states, but also the high level of shutdown that I believe is more prevalent in our Western societies. This is something I've been thinking about, talking about more and more with my colleagues and friends who are into this work. We are really starting to realize even those who are highly skilled are still living in some form of functional freeze. And the environment has to be pretty, pretty safe and pretty good. And how we interact with the people every day in our lives, how we treat ourselves, all of it is an effort to help the system come out of this functional freeze that we have collectively been in for centuries, right? And many of us aren't even aware that we're in it because it's just so normal. 
Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, again, someone's asking how to find a good body worker. Got to look it up, do your research and watch the video that I did that we posted above or in the show more section if you're listening to the recording um, on how to find a good practitioner. Jedi Bunny asks, can you expand on how babies feel parents fear and discomfort? My friend has a newborn who, according to my friend, is the angriest, fussiest baby. I'm wondering how that be, might be manifesting. Well, basically, when we are an infant, everything in our field is felt. And so if our caregiver is harboring intense anger, if they are... I'm going to just use an example, trying to be the peaceful person and meditating and being all love and light. But deep down, there is a lot of stored aggression and rage and in, in just fight flight energy that's been sandwiched with the freeze response. That baby, because they are all feeling, they are all, they're all um, guts. People will say they're all heart, but they're all guts. Our first brain is our gut. It is our viscera. And so those organs are so tuned to what is in the energetic field. You know, if you've ever walked into a room and like your hair stand on end, like you just feel something isn't right. Those babies are doing that all the time. And so they will express the stored anger. They'll express the tension in the parent, in the mother. And so the question is, if you were here at the beginning of the talk, are those parents open to the fact that maybe their physiology is what is impacting their child? Many people don't want to hear that. And um, it's unfortunate because that is often what is occurring. So again, I did a video a little while ago on how, um, to, how to create healthy human starts here. It's an older video of mine, but it gets into the branches of the parasympathetic, the vagus nerve and how we learn how to co-regulate. But yeah, that's exactly why and how babies um, fuss. It's often very little to do with their system having something wrong, but their system is expressing intensity and strain because of the environment they are in. Yeah, and animals as well, right? Animals will know where we're at um, this is why actually working with animals for some people can be very, very useful, especially horses, and they can feel our intensity, they can feel our fear. Um, and so that is one way that we can um, work with our physiology is working with um, animals that are able to, um, they sense us, and then we have to, it's almost like a way of doing biofeedback, right? It's like, oh, this, this horse is not knowing how to settle, maybe I'm not settled, my system has to settle. And when the system settles, they settle. All right, everybody, um, thank you so much. I'm going to end it for today. Um, again, just a review today, I wanted to talk about what it means to be trauma informed. Um, and I proposed at the beginning that we just need to be human informed. So I'm kind of like putting a wrench in the spokes here. Um, and a lot of this comes down to the work we do on ourselves, but also how we, um, my words that I mentioned were education, how we get educated around the nervous system, how we attune to ourselves, and how we learn to attune to ourselves will greatly impact how we attune to others. And this is so, so true for infants, uh, children, but of course the people we work with, our partners, our family members, Heck, even people that we see randomly on the streets and in stores. Um, orienting. I didn't get into this deeply, but this ability to reconnect to the here and now. When we have had lots of traumatic stuff happen to us, we get pulled out of the here and now. We get pulled out of our mind even. We get pulled out of our body. And so orienting to the here and now, restoring a healthy orienting response to the environment is super key. I've actually done quite a few videos videos on those. Um, one is um, uh, what the heck is orienting. It's a long form uh, lecture like this that I did well over a year ago. And the other is um, the two kinds of orienting responses to be aware of. So 
If you haven't seen those, you've got your homework after this, go and watch those. Um, safety, the ability to restore safety back to the system. And this is more than just, if you can recall, I said earlier, just seeing that we're safe. That is one way, but we have to cellularly work with the organs in the body. And this is, again, what I do in my bigger programs where we're working with the stress chemicals, the brainstem, the gut, all of that. And then authenticity. So that I covered, if you can recall, where I gave you the example of being with that nurse where I was getting an IV put in. I was just damn authentic. I'm like, I shouldn't be scared, but I am. My heart rate is telling me something different. And so I was authentic. I told her that, right? And remember, if we were never allowed to express our authentic self when we were young, this is a huge leap in trust in getting that out and risking that vulnerability and being raw. But the moment we start to tell the truth of what's happening in ourselves, usually the person on the other side appreciates it. Usually, and I know it's not always the case, so you gotta be discerning on when you do these things, but for the most part, when it is a professional, they appreciate you being authentic because they might be sensing something too and they don't know what it is. So those were the five things. Again, education, attunement, orienting, safety, authenticity. Um, and let's just be human informed, everyone. Let's just go forward and, and just learn what it means to be a human in this human body with other people, in our biology, connecting with others, providing safety for others. Um, and yeah, let's, let's keep practicing. So final thing. I got class on Saturday. If you're seeing this now, um, I think it's the 12th of June, 12 p.m. on Zoom. You can register via my site. It's $19 for a 60-minute class. It's called a drop-in class. I guide you through practical stuff. It's very, very little theory, practical um, neurosensory exercises. The end of June, I'm doing a three-day intensive that is a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's the 28th, the 29th, and the 30th. Um, and so that's summer school. Again, all of this will be on my site soon. We're working on it right now. Um, and then if you haven't started with my 21 day nervous system tune up, you guys want to know how to work with me. That's how you start in addition to these smaller classes. And if you start now on that, you will be primed and ready for when we begin smart body, smart mind in March of 2020, which is my long form 12 week course that we have been running uh, for quite a few years now. We just finished the 10th round of Smart Body, Smart Mind. This stuff is real, it works. This past year, we've been studying it at a neuroscience lab out of the University of Victoria. So it's, it's, it's real stuff, right? This isn't just something that I threw together in a year or two. These are the practices and the studies and the theories that I have been immersed in since 2004, which is more than a few years ago. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for all your emojis and hearts. Um, and just, yeah, we're all in this together. We're all here to heal, I believe. Um, not all of us got a good start at the beginning, and that's fine. And then we have to move forward and move through all of this and just start healing so that we can, so that we can be in a much better place as the, as the world and as time moves forward. Love to all of you, and um, we'll see you maybe at drop-in class on Saturday. Bye for now.